It was uh, 60 years ago on this day, April 16th, 1963, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail. He was going through a very challenging time in his life. The success of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 had kind of faded and they were looking for a new place by which the civil rights movement could be extended. And so in 1961, they chose Albany, Georgia. And this was gonna be the very first time they wanted to desegregate an entire city. And so uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had done some work there and Dr. King came. And they had planned mass rallies and marches. But the chief of police in Albany, Georgia had read Dr. King's books on nonviolence to civil disobedience. And so Chief Pritchett uh, did not do anything violent uh, during the protest. They very nicely marched the people who were, they were resting into the paddy wagons. Uh, he had uh, read that the purpose was to fill the jails, so he did not just rely upon the jails in Albany, Georgia, but had commissioned jails all across that section of Georgia. So as the protesters were being arrested, there were far more jails than there were protesters. And so after a while, he ran out of protesters. Uh, there was no violence, and so the TV cameras were not there. And so Dr. King called it a failure. And uh, from that, he was going through a great deal of uh, concern as to what the movement's next step would be. And uh, in 1963, uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth uh, had been leading demonstrations in what was the most segregated city in America, Birmingham, Alabama. Many people called it Bombingham because there were so many unsolved bombings. And uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth's house had been bombed several times itself. So he convinced Dr. King to come into this literally uh, place by which was probably the most difficult place in the nation to go into and they had probably the most racist sheriff in the country by the name of Bull Connor. And uh, as the protesters began to march and rally, many of them from Miles College in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Do we have any Miles College graduates? Or Miles College in Alabama. And uh, from that, the demonstration started and they arrested Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy and put them in very terrible jail situations. And from in that jail, about uh, eight white clergy wrote a letter calling for unity, asking that Dr. King and his people would leave because they were outside agitators, as well as he was disrupting the harmony and the tranquility of Birmingham. And so that uh, letter that was put in the newspaper was smuggled into the prison to Dr. King. And since Dr. King had time, he had a chance to spend time and address the specific concerns of those uh, eight white clergy persons. And I want to spend a little time on this today because the letter from the Birmingham jail, many people feel are the most, is the most significant uh, letter or theses on the civil rights movement, not just for when it happened in 1963, but how its legacy should continue even to today. So it is okay to spend about five minutes today just to give a little background on the letter from the Birmingham jail written by Dr. King from a prison cell 60 years ago today. Can you give multimedia a hand praise? I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <laughs> To Alabama Governor George Wallace, the continuation of segregation was a solemn promise. To Martin Luther King, it was a scourge he vowed to overcome. In the city of Birmingham, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, whose church and home had been bombed because of his activism, began a campaign to integrate the downtown shopping district. King joined him in March of 1963. They both expected an extreme response from Public Safety Commissioner, segregationist, Eugene Bull Connor. One of the good fortunes of the civil rights movements were its enemies. Where could you find a better enemy than Bull Connor of Birmingham? King submitted to arrest on April 12th, Good Friday, to draw maximum press coverage. 
Attorney General Robert Kennedy had asked King to avoid confrontations with police, wanting to pursue civil rights gains through the courts, not the streets. Dr. King said, Mr. Attorney General, I can best serve this country and my people by focusing on the evils of segregation. Uh, he said it's a corruption of the society, it's a corruption of the soul. Sitting in his jail cell in Birmingham, King wrote about that corruption. He responded to an open letter that appeared in the Birmingham News that same day. It was titled, A Call for Unity, and was signed by eight white clergymen. Their appeal made reference to outside leadership, calling the protests unwise and untimely. King wrote in the margins of that newspaper, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. He went on, Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. The sentiments King expressed in the letter had already made an impact on students who had committed themselves to civil rights activism throughout the Deep South. We were greatly influenced by Martin Luther King Jr. and the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. But we didn't like the, the tempo of change. We wanted to speed it up. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, in the need of On May 3rd, students re-energized the campaign. Some were in high school, others were even younger. The Birmingham campaign became known as the Children's Crusade. It was easy for black students like myself in the South to say, well, if they can do it in Little Rock, they can do it in Montgomery. If they can stand up, we can stand up too. When Bull Connor ordered the police to disperse the protesters with dogs, it was clear this was a real battle, a violent confrontation. Firemen were ordered to use the full force of their hoses on the demonstrators. The local newspapers supported Bull Connor's response, blaming the chaos on the demonstrators. I really believe he thought somehow in some way that he was chaos, but he, he didn't understand the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. He didn't understand the spirit of the movement. Television and newspaper reports captured the brutality in Birmingham and showed it to the whole nation. Outside the region, it was shocking. It was horrifying. It was unacceptable. It brought the civil rights movement into people's homes with many American families watching the, the six o'clock news in such a way that it simply just couldn't be ignored. In just a week, the demonstrators' nonviolent response created a public outcry that Birmingham could not dismiss. On May 10th, symbols of segregation, like separate water fountains, became relics as city leaders signed the Birmingham Truce. In addition, a plan was agreed upon to desegregate lunch counters. This was the kind of meaningful negotiation Martin Luther King had called for in his letter. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I've heard the word, wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that Justice too long delayed is justice denied. These words had inspired citizens young and old to take direct action in the streets of Birmingham. The letter was soon published in newspapers and magazines, and its power was undeniable. King had gone to Birmingham to fight injustice. In the end, his most powerful weapon was the letter he wrote from the confines of a jail cell. Can you give the Lord's name the honor, the praise, and the glory? Today's sermon topic is a letter from the Birmingham jail. And the reason why um, this letter is so significant is because Dr. King was writing it to address 
a specific letter that he had read from eight white clergy. But the letter was so profound that it has lasting legacy now over 60 years later. Um, the reason why it's significant is because Dr. King has died, but that legacy of that letter still lives. The reason why that is important is because when we look at the Bible, there's several letters that have lasting significance. One is uh, John's letter uh, of revelation from the Isle of Patmos, in which he got caught up on the Lord's day. And even though he was in prison on a lonely isle called Patmos, the letter or the revelation was able to get out and has become the very last book of the Bible in which many of us know, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the old earth was passed away, and behold, there was no more sea. And I, John, saw a holy city, a, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven like a bride ordained for her husband. The other letters that we know have come from the apostle Paul. Paul's letters were primarily written to specific people or specific situations, for instance, in Corinth or in Philippi or um, other cities in which he had actually established churches and was talking or writing about specific issues in those churches. But Romans was a little different. Rome he had never been to. And he was writing because he had hoped to get to Rome. And he was writing because Rome was the center of the world at that time. Rome was the most important city in the most important empire in the entire world and in the history of the world. And so Paul wanted to have his headquarters, so to speak, in Rome so he could have a greater influence of promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ to a larger group of persons. He had hoped to get to Rome after having raised an offering in Corinth, and he was going to take that offering to the church in Jerusalem. But he knew there was going to be a lot of danger. He knew that he might not even make it to Jerusalem because of those who were coming against him. So he wrote the letter in case he did not make it. He knew the letter would survive. And his reason for going would always be known for the, to the Christian church for generation after generation. Paul hoped to go from Rome to then to Spain because many of the great writers and the thinkers at that time were from Spain uh, and they had influenced Rome. So that was Paul's intent. And so as Paul was making these plans and getting ready to go to Rome, he wrote this letter to the Romans saying, I'm getting ready to come. And in chapter number one that was read by Reverend Washington, he introduces himself. And he begins by saying, in a sense, my name is Paul, and if you turn to chapter number one, he begins, I am an apostle. An apostle is an ambassador. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I am not coming on my own. I'm representing the one who has sent me. So if I am the ambassador of, to Ghana from the United States, I'm not coming as Granger Browning. I'm coming as a representative of the government of the United States to Ghana. So I'm not saying what I think, I'm saying what the United States government is saying. So when he's an ambassador of Christ, he is not coming in and of himself. He's coming saying, I've come in the name of the Lord. Can you look at someone and say, I'm an ambassador. Yeah. Everywhere I go, I hope I'm representing Jesus Christ. And he says, not only am I an apostle, he also going, he goes on to say, when I look at my life, I am a, a separated one. Yeah. I used to be a separated Pharisee. Pharisees separated themselves from everyone, and they abided by every law of the Old Testament. It's going to get better in a second. You can tap the neighbor. <laughs> and so he was separated. He was considered holy. But now, he says, I'm no longer tied down by the law as an Old Testament Pharisee trying to live out the law of the Old Testament. But now, I am separated unto Jesus Christ. And as I am separated unto Jesus Christ, Paul goes on to say, in that separation, Jesus is now my Lord. 
I, I am not only an ambassador, he is the one that controls my life. He is the one that dictates everything that I do. And then he goes on to say, as he is my Lord, I also want you to know that he comes from the tribe of David, which is his human side. But he also is the one that resurrected from the dead. And that came about because the Holy Spirit raised him. So he is both human and divine. And with those two things, he knows everything about me because he's lived on this earth and nothing I have gone through or am going through, he does not know about because he went through pain, he went through suffering, but also he is divine because he's the only one that got up from the grave and now lives forever and ever. So because he's not only human, but it's also divine, Paul goes on to say, because of that, I now serve him because as a servant of him, as an ambassador of him, I now embrace his love by faith. It is by faith that I receive the love of Christ, not because of what I have done, but because of what he has done for me. And I receive that by faith. It's not that I have done anything to deserve it. I receive what he has done for me by faith. Uh, Dr. Thomas Holt, who was uh, our New Testament professor at Howard University, Reverend Washington, he has a commentary in the book that's called True to Our Native Land, an African-American New Testament commentary. It is edited by uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Kane Hope Felder, who came to Ebenezer many times, and I think only 10 students have ever received an A in his class, and I thank God that two of them are Ebenezer ministerial staff, and Reverend Dr. Boyd and <laughs> Reverend Mary. <Yeah. laughs> Reverend Ridley, did you get an A? Did you get an A? Yes, did you get an A? Okay, that's <laughs> I didn't want to leave anybody out. Uh, but in that, Dr. Hoyt is saying that the, what Paul is writing, he is writing very specifically to persons because he wants them to know the love of Christ. When persons sing love songs, they are singing from a perspective to a particular person. So when Aretha sang Dr. Feelgood, she was talking about somebody. When Smokey sang, ooh, baby, baby, he was talking about somebody. When Phoebe Snow and Phyllis Hyman and, uh, t sang, they were talking about somebody. I know you don't know who they are. You have to be in my generation. <laughs> and when the Delphonic sang, they were talking about someone. When Luther sang, he was talking. The, the love songs were to somebody. Paul is writing to, he's not writing to have it studied as we do now in systematic theology. He, he was not writing to have a grand thesis. He, he, he was writing simply because he wanted you to know what Christ meant to him. And, and Christ means to him that I'm an ambassador. Everything I do, I do representing him. I'm a servant, therefore I am serving him. And I get what I've gotten, not because I'm so smart or so wonderful. And Paul's idea that has permeated the entire Christian faith is grace. I, I have received grace, and, and grace is I don't deserve it. There's nothing I can do to earn it, but all I can do is receive it. And, and because I'm receiving it, I can't take the grace for granted. Uh, Dr. Hoyt in the analysis, in the commentary says, it, it's like if you were raised in a family and the family gave you everything you needed. It wasn't because you did anything, you were just born into it. And you don't take it for granted, but you want to live out the blessings that your family has given to you. And so as you heard when Bishop Bride came, 48 years ago, I received Christ. And once I received Christ, it was wonderful. But the question is, what do I do now? Like Paul, and the reason I have become to like Paul is because I see myself in some ways like Paul. I was a critique of the church. I was a criticizer of the church. Some of you remember when I, my final history thesis in my senior year was the church, the opium of the people. I tore the church up. And my teacher, who was a Christian, tore my paper up. Uh, it was like she was just going Holy Ghost mad. Red was all over it. The F took up the entire page. <laughs> 
I thought it was the best paper I'd ever written. And, and so I, I, I took delight in tearing down the church. I thought the church was, had no purpose. And this was during the 60s and the 70s where it was an anti-church sentiment, much like today. And so I can relate to Paul in the sense that I, I, I have, as I, after I got saved, I had to ask myself, now what? And I began to look at my life and said, I was too blessed to be doing so little. Yeah, I was working, I was a teacher, but, but I cannot receive all of this that I have received and, and, and not be able to do more with my life. And, 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 and because of that, I began to see ways by which I could get involved. And as you heard in 1975, I received Christ. And about eight months later, uh, Reverend Greg Leonard uh, said, Greg, you ought to come to the men's fellowship, Reverend Washington. I said, well, that's, 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 that's okay. But, I, you know, I'm new to Christ. He says, oh, don't worry about it. He did not tell me they were having an election that night. And, and so I've told this story before, but as I got there, there were 10 positions to be filled. There were about 10 brothers that were there. They came to the end of the nominations, and then Reverend Leonard, at that time, Brother Leonard stood up and said, I reckon I uh, nominate Brother Browning to be chaplain. And so I, I said, I can't be chaplain. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just got saved, and they all in favor, I, all in the pills. So I, and so the very next time, uh, uh, one of the brothers said, I want to share a scripture that I had read. And he said, I, I want you to turn with me to uh, First Chronicles, the 23rd chapter. He didn't say Old Testament or New Testament. I didn't know. So I turned to First Corinthians. <laughs> and I was looking in my Bible. And I said, hmm. And I, so I actually said, uh, I apologize, but there's no 23rd chapter in uh, First Corinthians. And uh, one of the brothers stood up, and Reverend Green was the head of the ministry. He said, Reverend Green, where'd you get this chaplain from? <laughs> I, 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 how can he be chaplain? And he didn't even know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I felt intimidated. Has anybody ever been placed in a situation where you felt intimidated? And so all I knew, I had taken one of my daddy's books a long time ago. It was called Dr. King's book. It was called Strength to Love. As you can see, it's, it's 60 years old. <laughs> it was, and uh, so it's a book of sermons of Dr. King, about 16 of them. And so I just began to read those sermons because I couldn't remain the way I was and be chaplain of the men's fellowship. And I didn't know the Bible. And all these defores and therefores and cometh's and goeths. I don't know about, I wasn't Shakespearean at all. I didn't, I didn't like Shakespeare. And at that time, there was no living Bible, no <laughs> revised then. And everybody said, that's what Jesus spoke, the king's English. And so I said, well, I can't understand. So I did understand Dr. King. And so I was able to study this. This, this became the way by which I got spiritually grounded so that I could be halfway decent as, as a chaplain. And then after that, in the Boston area, um, most of the students in the era, young adults, Reverend Smith, went to Boston University or Harvard or MIT or Boston College. And, and so I went to, at that time, Howard students don't laugh, Reverend Joe, I went to Hampton Institute. And so, and so I remember standing outside of my Baptist church with a friend that was a Harvard student, and the, one of the older members said, where are you going to school, young man? He, and he said, I'm going to Harvard. Oh, wonderful. That's, that's, that's incredible. What you, I'm going to Harvard Law School. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's tremendous. Uh, young man, where are you going? I said, uh, I just graduated from Hampton Institute. Oh, okay. And then he went back to the Harvard. <laughs> so... I know today, with the emphasis on black colleges, at that time, having graduated from a black college in Boston carried very little significance. And so even that was an intimidation. I was surrounded by persons in the men's fellowship that were Harvard graduates, MIT graduates, Boston College graduates. And here I was, didn't even know where First, First uh, Chronicles was. And they were just laughing at me, not just because I was spiritually ignorant, but I didn't have the same credentials as they had. Anybody felt underqualified? 
And not only that, I, I, I can recall, I was with the NAACP, I was elected vice president. And again, the board was made up of all these Harvard, MIT, Boston University, Boston College persons, and Tom Atkins was the president. My first one time he couldn't make the meeting, so I had to chair the meeting, and they just had a field day with me. And not only that, Brother Brown, with the fraternity, I was vice bossless of that, and one day, but mostly the bossless could not make it, I had to oversee that. And you had Richard Taylor, the first, not the first black, but the first. Rhodes Scholar from Boston University, period. It, it was a case by which it was a who's who of black, and I messed up there. And the, the frat was like, how did we ever elect him? A Hampton Institute graduate to be over. Has anybody ever been placed in a situation where you felt, my God, why am I here? And not only that, you're asking God, why? Am I here? And the answer I got back was grace. Yes. Yes. Paul was saying, how am I an apostle? How am I someone that am now being asked to travel across the Christian world? And he said, by grace. Yes. It's not, if anything, I should be, be condemned. I, I was a Pharisee. I, I actually tried to kill Christians. But here God's grace has been upon me. He's looked beyond my faults and see my needs. And now I'm in a situation that I don't deserve to be in. Can you look at somebody? But favor got me in. So therefore, in those situations, I'm not saying what I have done. I'm saying if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. So whatever you're doing today, whatever Christ has you doing today, don't think you're there because you're qualified. Don't think you're there because you have all the credentials. But you ought to thank God for his grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see it. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. But grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace shall lead me home. Do I have anybody that can say, praise God? Praise God. Praise God. Can you give a neighbor a holy high five and tell him, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So Paul had wanted to get to Spain. He never made it, but Paul was able to say, by grace, I'm still gonna keep on trucking. I'm still gonna keep on working because if God put me here, God's gonna do great things with me here. Do I have a witness? Wherever God plants you, he wants you to grow. Can you look at somebody and tell them, it's time to grow up? I know it may be intimidating. I know you may not be qualified, but God is working all things together for your good. Glory, hallelujah. So from that Birmingham jail, Dr. King wrote a letter. He was in prison, he was confined, he had no way out. Anybody this morning feel in prison? Anybody this morning feel stifled? Anybody this morning feel locked in and locked out? But hallelujah, look out. God's getting ready to have you free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. That's why Dr. King could say, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Why? Because I left the letter, and the letter lets you know we will not get to the promised land on Pharaoh's chariots. This letter lets you know uh, that freedom is never given by the oppressor. It has to be taken by the oppressed. This letter lets you know uh, that they'll always tell you to wait, uh, but wait always means never. So you're gonna have to roll up your sleeves and believe by grace uh, that God's gonna open doors, that God's gonna make a way. Can anybody thank grandma? Can anybody thank grandpa? Can anybody thank mama? 
Can anybody thank Daddy for making a way, for blazing a trail? And here we are, can walk through it. That's why today somebody can say, I don't feel no way's tired. I've come too far to turn around now. Nobody told me that the road would be easy, but I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me now. Look at somebody say, God has something better up in store. Greater is coming. Why did God put me there at such a time as this? Because God knew that one day I would have a future standing in a pulpit, an Ebenezer African Methodist Episcopal Church. I did not know the difference before 1 Corinthians and 1 Chronicles, but God was preparing me for something greater. Look at somebody and tell them, get ready. God's preparing you for something greater. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and you can imagine what God is getting ready to do. So hold on a little while longer. These heavy burdens will soon be passing over. Run the race, keep the faith, and in God's own time, your elevation, your season is getting ready to turn around for your good. And if you know this is your turnaround season, it's all right to turn around one time for the Father, one time for the Son, and one time for the Holy Ghost, and give the Lord's name the praise. It's a new season. It's a new day. God's blessings are coming my way. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you for a letter. But hallelujah, more than the letter. Thank you for the legacy. And we thank God that one glad moment when this life is over, you too will leave a legacy. Yeah! What will be your testimony? Grace woke me up this morning. Grace started me on my way. And if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. Can you stand on the church today? Can you give the Lord's name? the honor, the praise, and the glory. <laughs> Can you look at somebody and tell them, better is still coming. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. My God, thank you, Jesus. God is getting ready to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what you ever could think or imagine. Hallelujah. <laughs> The last time I flew into Birmingham, I flew into the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth Airport. I said the last time I flew into Birmingham, I flew into the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth Airport. Can you look at somebody and say, God's gonna turn this situation around. Hallelujah. For 20 years, Birmingham had a black mayor by the name of Richard Arrington. I said for 20 years, from a place we could not vote to a place we elected a mayor for 20 years, I want somebody to know God can turn your situation around. Do I have a witness in the house? Can you look at somebody and tell you it's not what it looks like? I know you may think you're confined right now. You might have people laughing at you because you don't measure up to what they think they have accomplished. They are judging themselves on what they have done. But you need to judge yourself on what God's getting ready to do. Tell them laugh if you want to. <laughs> but just wait a little while. <laughs> I said wait a little while. 
I said, wait a little while. And God's going to do exceedingly beyond what you ever could think or imagine. Does anyone know that the best is still yet to come? That you ain't seen nothing yet? Pastor, I'm 85. You still you haven't seen nothing yet. Pastor, my good days are behind me. My body is sick. Nah, you ain't seen nothing yet. God's going to bless you. My God, thank you, Jesus. Your latter years are going to be greater than your former. And if that's you, can you give the Lord's name the honor, the praise, and the glory?